Hey y'all, it's Libby Redden. Welcome back to the podcast. We are in a studio today. This is very exciting. I've been, a lot of you have been watching the podcast for a long time. I've been doing it for almost four years and we've done the virtual. I've gone into people's homes, but I've yet to be in a studio. So I'm very excited to be here. Today I have on Kate Truitt and I'm going to give you a little intro before we hop into the episode. Uh, she is an award-winning clinical psychologist and applied neuroscientist. She is internationally recognized for her expertise in trauma, stress, and resilience. Kate is the founder of the Truett Institute and serving as a CEO to two other organizations. She's delivered keynotes to prestigious platforms like the UN and the U.S. Department of Defense, reaching hundreds of thousands of people via her social media platforms as well. Uh, she's also the author of Healing in Your Hands and her newest book that I'll, we'll talk about in just a minute. But really at the core of what drew me to Kate was her hope-driven view of vulnerability and humanness. And this real advocacy for radical acceptance of the human experience and how our spectrums of light and darkness are okay and not only okay, but normal. And experiencing all of those things should be not just accepted, but celebrated because that is the human experience. So Kate, thank you so much for being right. here. Thank you Hello. for having me, Libby. And <laughs> thank you for inviting me into this incredible moment yeah. in your podcast journey. I'm so honored and delighted. Thank you. Yeah, this is, I also just want to, breaking the third wall for anyone watching, this is also, since it's the first time in studio, this is, new for me, so we're, we're guinea pigging it. <laughs> we're on the journey. We're on the journey, on yeah. The journey. First thing I just want to say, the overarching theme of this episode as I was diving into Kate's work and preparing questions is that the topics will get heavy. Mm -hmm. However, my goal is to leave you feeling hopeful because I think sometimes when we talk about these things, that isn't what <laughs> the result is. And, you know, of course, we're not always going to feel hopeful. We're people, but I feel like as as a podcast, my goal has to shine light in places that can feel quite dark. And today, today I'm just going to talk about Kate. About I'm going to talk to Kate about some advice she would have given her younger self, mm -hmm. based on what she's learned about the human mind and her work and her life experiences, harnessing the healing and resiliency of the human mind, and finding hope in our in our most dark or shameful or scary moments. And we'll kind of connect all those topics back to her, her new book, Keep Breathing, which I have right here. I'll show you <laughs> the copy. You can also um, show your book, Livy. I'm just saying. Her, <laughs> my book, book as well. Also my, amazing. my book's available. And if you have not read it, you <laughs> must. It's incredible. Thank you so much. So her new book, Keep Breathing, which is a memoir, part memoir and part scientific exploration of the human mind and spirit's extraordinary ability to persevere and come back to oneself. And using a quote that she uses in her book, mm -hmm. she closes with the line, never underestimate your ability to experience the darkness and still shine on. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really want to dive into today. So... Kate, the first thing I kind of wanted to get into was getting a little bit more background on your childhood and kind of, because so much of our childhood really informs who we grow to be. Mm -hmm. And the first thing uh, I kind of wanted to dive into was there was a lot of struggle that happened in your childhood and teen years. However, I, I, I imagine there was a lot of joy in that young Kate too. And like the first thing, instead of opening with the struggle, I just want to hear about what she loved and what things she found fascinating. Like what sparked her? Oh, uh, reading and writing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, this is funny. I, I always assumed I'd be an author. Oh, really? But I wanted, and, and I had my pen name, Grace de Marseille. <laughs> and I okay. thought I would be, this is really funny. A romance novelist. Yes! <laughs> That's so awesome! <laughs> Which, honestly, in, in hindsight, was really about my deep yearning for connection and the kind of breadth of darkness and isolation and aloneness that I struggled with throughout my childhood. Right. But being able to connect into stories, whether they be fictional or non-fictional, memoirs, I mean, the ability to just lose myself into somebody else's journey 
and find the possibility of light and hope within those words. And then to go to my trusty little journal and start writing, or eventually yeah. my Apple IIc computer. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. And just start clacking away on the keys. That was the biggest gift and joy to me, and I believe in many ways saved my life. And then the other thing that I know saved my life was I grew up in Kansas, and I was very, very lucky to be living close to a barn and I could ride my bike out to the barn. And so when things got really, really hard, I'd go spend time with the horses. Mm. And I had a beautiful mare and she would, I would just stay with her for long, long, long periods of time. Mm. Horses are incredible. I they love, are. I grew up, my yeah. grandparents had a, had a farm mm. and I just, it's just like, Mm. almost like the wisdom mm. you can feel. I don't really know what that is, oh, but there's something about ancient. horses that are just like... It is ancient. It's crazy. Yeah. It's so interesting. Yeah. Well, and I take that back to the narrative of our species. Mm. Like horses and dogs, I'm a huge dog lover. Horses, dogs were such a critical immersion for our evolutionary survival. Mm. And yeah massive and so I, I believe that through right. the course of time we've built these attachments and for children who are growing up with really deep agonizing loneliness when we can find a connection with anything in the world that literally has the ability to save a life yeah interesting I've never really thought about it that way I, I think way too deeply about way too many no things. I love it <laughs> and like a funny a funny question though is there like if you don't mind sharing, uh, is I'm there an, like I'm, a, I'm literally an open book is, now. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Is there a romance novel you remember writing at that age that like? Oh yes, I wrote a beautiful book called Forgiven. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. It was about Grace and Todd and Henry oh, and, and Todd. Rosemary. I know it was so complicated. It was a western. Yes. Um, I learned how to remove bullets and and how they would actually do it in the 1800s. Really? Yeah. This this is a portrait of Kate in her early teens. That was very cool. That's so awesome. How <laughs> old were you when you wrote it? I started writing when I was about 12 or 13. 12 or 13. Yeah. And you were like, I have to also <laughs> learn. That's so funny when and you're like, to learn it's got to be anatomically and scientifically accurate as yes. well. And we're oh, going to yes. learn. That's so funny. Yeah. Well, there's a sanctity in the science for me. Like, oh, I know this. So when the right. world feels out of control, oh, yeah. science Absolutely. is structure. Mm -hmm. You know, and then of course I wanted to narrow science, which is like the quantum physics of science. Yeah. So then I was like, oh, emotional chaos and science. Let's go do that. Right. Hence quantum physics or neuroscience. Interesting. Yeah. So it already kind of like showed up from an early yeah. age, which it kind of tends to do. I think it does too. Yeah. yeah for you, did it? Uh, yeah. I uh, I was definitely. Um, I was just very curious, uh, and for me, it was more of like, not science as much, but just like. I did really want to know how things worked. I loved building things. I would come up with, I had like an inventions journal mm. and I wow. would invent stuff, that whatever, cool. meet the Robinsons <laughs> type deal. Wow. And I would, yeah, I just, I loved to create things. I made a lot of videos. Mm. Like I've been hitting that record button since out the <laughs> womb, for real. But yeah, definitely Full just circle. like a desire to create was like very yeah. apparent from, mm. from the mm -hmm. beginning for me. Yeah. I, I had heard you mention in a podcast episode I was listening to, you said the goal of my two books was to turn around to my 16-year-old self and say, mm -hmm. if only you have this data, if only you had this data, dear one. Yeah. Is there a specific moment that comes to mind where you look back at that young Kate and you're like, gosh, if Babe. only she knew. Baby girl. If, like, I, know. I, I mean, I, there's got to be a vast amount of moments, but I'm curious if one in particular kind of comes into your mind. There, there are. I, I appreciate oh. you reflecting that there's a vast amount yeah. of moments. I think for so many of us, when we allow and feel the safety to go back and revisit our young selves, because that safety to go back there is such a big part of it, too. Mm -hmm. and, and even in my own journey, it's taking me a long time to be able to go partner with some of the younger parts of me that I always carried a lot of shame and judgment around. Right. And I think, so to answer your question, it, it's really going back to those parts that I alienated myself from. Mm. They, I, so like 11, 10, 11 years old, where I just was in so much pain. And I went into puberty very early. Mm -hmm. 
Um, going into fourth grade, I shot up, I got super tall, I gained, and like everything all of a sudden was too short and too tight, and I had developed really bad acne, and my entire mm. system was out of control, and trust Growing me, sex pains. ed in Kansas, not a thing, yeah. and you know, my parents were doing everything they could, but they had a lot going on, and I just tried to hide, mm. and I just look at my young self, who was so despairing, and I'm just like, oh, baby girl, oh, baby girl. Yeah. And I just wish I could go back and embrace her. And I do that now, emotionally right. and mentally. Right. And, and that's such a huge part of the work of everything I do is how do we not only help our kiddos have the tools, just like the, the work that you do. Mm -hmm. Your passion is how do we inspire our future generations to have these tools and the knowledge? And also, how do we support our parents? Right. Our administrators, our right. first responders, our teachers to know how to interact in these really precious and important ways when you know, these, our little ones, ourselves, are rolling out of control. Mm -hmm. So if anything, it kind of sounds like it wouldn't be so much you would tell her something, but create a space for her to yeah. feel seen. Beautiful reflection. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and, and it's it's so interesting because I find, and I know some like listeners have probably heard mm -hmm. me say this before where it's like when I first kind of entered this space uh, where I was like there's these emotional skills and, yeah. and like neurological regulation skills that we just don't know, we're not given. Uh, when I first kind of started doing the work, I would make videos and just kind of tell people information. Yeah. Uh, me and too. Then as, yeah. <laughs> and then as time went on, I was like, oh, actually, people just want to feel seen. At yes. the very core of it, people yeah. want to feel seen. Yeah. And I think the same thing applies to, yeah. like, when parents ask me how they can better support their teenagers or anything mm -hmm. like that, it's like, at the very core, core of it is that they're probably often at war with their minds and just need a, a place to feel seen. Yeah, and at war with their minds is such a powerful and important way to describe it. Mm -hmm. is, that is so real. Yeah. So real. Yeah. And, and it kind of really beautifully leads into another question I wanted to ask you where, you know, you found yourself struggling with suicidal ideation at a really young mm -hmm. age. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of a topic a lot around young people right now. Number one killer of adolescents and teens. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and I feel like there's so much you could unpack with that, but I... More than anything, I would love to hear your thoughts on what is it that young people are feeling in those moments that is often bypassed or misunderstood? Like what's actually going on in their mind and maybe even on a neurological level too that's just like, because it can be hard to understand what's going on in a child's mind when also they might not have the emotional vocabulary to mm -hmm. tell you. And, and most of the time they won't. Right. And the, I mean, as much as social emotional learning is starting to roll out across the nation, I would still, it's the privileged few that have the opportunity to turn inward and learn about their emotions or the and it's right. privileged classrooms mm -hmm. that are partnering with these incredible programs doing that work. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm actually doing a, a wonderful event later this week with the Matthew Silverman Memorial Foundation. And mm. it, Matthew, unfortunately completed the act of suicide. And this is an investment that this organization has done now to roll out information and support and engagement at a national level to say, hey, this is real. And what if people knew how to have these conversations? Right. And so even for our adolescents, for our teens, and from 10 years old, I wasn't even, I don't even know if I was an adolescent at that point. Right. I mean, and I didn't know what it was. I learned from a Christopher Pike book. For, for anybody who knows what Christopher Pike or R.L. Stein is, they're kind of mm -hmm. thriller teen authors back in the 90s, when one of the characters was saying they wanted to end their life or just never wake up. And I was like, oh, man, I've been feeling that way for years. That, yeah, wow. interesting. And in that moment, I, to your point, Libby, felt seen. Mm. I'm not alone in this. Right. And so much of the work that we all need to do for ourselves, for our inner young ones, and for the world at large is to be able to have these conversations. To say, wait a minute, yes, this stuff can feel dark. Yes, it can feel heavy and scary. 
And it's, it can be way scarier if we're not talking about it. Right, right. And, and really, su I view suicide neurobiologically as the brain's last escape hatch when the pain gets too big. And you know, if it's a physical pain, we do something about it. If it's emotional pain, we don't. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's not seen, and it gets missed, and, and you know, it's invisible until the brain finally goes, I'm so alone, and I'm so paralyzed. There's no way out of this. Mm -hmm. And in some respects, those considerations, those thoughts start to become a way for us to say, hey, we need to have a different conversation here. If somebody can feel safe enough to say, I'm having these thoughts. Right. They can be turned into an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Because it's, it's interesting that you say that, too, because it has me kind of reflecting on my young self. And there were mm -hmm. definitely, like, quite a few, you know, thoughts that I would have. And I just, like, there was so much shame around, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. thinking, like, for your thoughts to go into a dark place, you, d you also don't really want to, like, <laughs> bring them to your parents and then, yeah. I don't know, them be like, why is my child crazy? Yeah. <laughs> or something and like that. Real. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Yeah. When it's like actually probably a lot mm -hmm. of people, mm -hmm. even if it's not suicidal ideation, are are experiencing very dark thoughts at a young age. Yeah. But it's we we just kind of ignored them or suppressed them because it's like, I'm not supposed to uh -huh. be thinking these things yeah. or even just intrusive thoughts or that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, and I, I believe, so in both of my books, I talk a lot about the amygdala. That's one of my deep areas of passion. Mm -hmm. And the amygdala is a critical survival part of our brain. And I reflect on, and, and part of my model is that the amygdala has three core values. How am I safe? Most people think about that, fear and the amygdala. Okay, Amy gets a lot of bad press. All about fear. But Amy, the amygdala, also is deeply focused on belonging and lovability and we learn as children how we can belong and how we will be loved and so for me growing up in a household that had a variety of factors that took a lot of attention from my parents some of them fundamental safety and you know roof over your head factors right but also some other ones that we were all navigating my role, I learned, was to be the people pleaser. Yep. And I'm still recovering from being a people pleaser. It's, yeah. it's a lifelong journey for me. And that I learned that if I was fine and if I was not causing issues and not disruptive and I see you smiling, I see yeah. you know your version. And I'm, so, I'm sure so many of your listeners know their version too. We, we embody this. And the shame piece gets really embodied embedded into us because we're going against the construct of the family structure for lovability and belonging. And that's the healthy, shame is basically designed to let us know you're outside the community norm. You need a course correct back. Mm. But what happens when being outside the community norm is actually pathological. And then mm. we grow up and we're now living in, and I, I used a really strong word in the book and my parents are so gracious. And I, I called it perverted. Hmm. It was a perverted family structure. Yeah. And there was no room for this stimulus to need anything until it got to the tipping point where it was so extreme that it was literally life or death. Right. And, right. and, and I'm not alone in that story. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that so many young people reach that place before mm. it's like, oh, we need to really take this seriously. The feelings that, that, that our child is experiencing and moving forward a little bit with your childhood experiences, moving into those teen years where you were having a lot of health issues. You had mentioned that you had almost died around nine times before you were 18. Yeah, I'm a cockroach. And yeah, so I heard you, I, I've, I've heard you talk about this persona of the cockroach. And people don't like it. They get so uncomfortable with it. And I'm yeah. like, no, 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 no. Cockroaches are ancient, ancient creatures. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny, my, my now husband, he's, he's so hilarious. He's like, would you just stop saying that? And I'm like, you need to understand 
that a cockroach, if you cut a cockroach, like a chicken will run around without its head on. Now, I'm from Kansas, like this is real farm girl stuff. <laughs> but a cockroach will live for two weeks without a head. Yeah. It's, it takes a serious death blow for a cockroach to actually be dead. Now, it's easy for us as humans to just squash a cockroach, like that's a death blow. But that embodying that as in those really dark moments is like you, the world will take so much from us sometimes. But as long as there's not a literal death blow, we ha can find or we can find the people who will help us find the ability to keep going. Mm -hmm. and, and that's in writing this book been a huge part of my journey is realizing how many unexpected people kept showing up. Right. Yeah. And how generous they were in that showing up. Mm. That's a great point to bring up, too, because I just think about really in my darkest moments, the people that just have gathered around me mm -hmm. every time. And it's not even and I've always been and you kind of talk about this in your book, someone where I kind of struggled recognizing or allowing myself to need help because yeah. it was like helps the, the difficult part <laughs> yeah. of the cockroach survival persona is am I being resilient or am I just like in a chronic state of survival mode yeah am I being pathologically independent that's right. something I've had to I do a lot of unwinding around myself right. I, I, I see you and I hear you 100 percent and on that topic I think there's a lot of young people that struggle with that like really yeah. hyper independence especially you know gr me growing up in a household that was in just like yeah, I mean, even before my dad got sick, it was like mm -hmm. a constant state of anger and stress mm -hmm. just consistently. And then once he got sick when I was 11, it was like, now you got to grow up and you've got to be ready to survive and keep this human alive as well. Yeah. And it's unlearning that hyper independence and like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> Everything's fine. fine. I'm fine. fine. I'm fine. Like, yeah. I don't know if you have any thoughts on first steps where people can unlearn that or mm -hmm. exercises that maybe have impacted you on how to sort of leave the I'm fine survival mode. Because sometimes you are fine, but... <laughs> what if fine's not the baseline? Right. Like, fine's not a good it's baseline. It's not really, yeah. yeah. One of my team members reflected to me the other day, and she's like one of the kind of backbone members of my organization. You've interacted with her, Lorelai. Hmm. It's amazing. And she's like, how are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm hanging in there. She's like, yeah, I'm noticing that that's your response a lot this week. What's going on? Yeah. And, and I, I think part of it is, and, and this is a larger ask than the, the, and I'll give you a baby step first. The, lar the, the bigger goal is to find the people who will reflect back upon us when we go into that automatic pattern. And what, those are, that's the village. Those are our village people, and they're amazing. And, and so, on the other hand, building a village like that for an I'm chronically fine, hyper-independent person, that is really hard work. And so one of the things I started doing, and this is actually an exercise in my Healing in Your Hands book, is really looking at when I'm saying I'm fine, or any iteration of that, because there's a million different versions of it, mm -hmm. What is the actual data point that my brain is giving me in that moment? Right. Is it an authentic? I'm fine. Things are great. Or is the I'm fine, my amygdala, showing up in a learned pattern of behavior and then opening up, in, in many respects, literally to a conversation, sometimes sitting down and doing left hand and right handed journaling and being like, hey, you who's fine, what's going on? And then my non-dominant hand responding with, I'm fine. Okay, I don't, and then my dominant hand, I, no, you're not, really, what's going on? Because I can notice something happening in my body. But that also is a I'm fine person, and let me tell me your experience of this. I dissociated from my body at a very young age. Mm -hmm. And so even learning to pay attention to what was happening in here was a huge part of the journey and also very disconcerting. Mm -hmm. It's just being like, oh, I'm feeling this in my body, and then my brain and my amygdala going, body sensations are scary. Yeah. Run away. Yeah. As Monty Python would say. And so to the point of Monty Python, also finding those little, like those little anchors that in the external world can provide a symbolic representation. 
So if you haven't mm. seen the Monty Python skit with the knife. I have not. Uh, YouTube it. Okay. YouTube it if you haven't seen it. It's hilarious. But really, it's this knight who keeps becoming more and more wounded. And that doesn't sound funny on the surface, but it's Monty Python. And so Monty Python is like become, they're, they're brilliant at really taking these common human experiences of pain, very British, and turning them into skit comedy for deeper learnings if you really watch. Right. And so you see this poor knight literally being torn apart in a very funny way. It's not, I don't think you need a trauma warning to watch it. Yeah, yeah. And he's going, I'm fine, I'm fine, everything's good here. Yeah. You know, and then run away. That's like another thing, just run away. Mm -hmm. And f But any version of those anchors that we can use in the outside world to reflect back into our own selves and go, wait a minute, I, re I have this external s scenario, this narrative that I saw on a TV show or I heard in a song that reminds me that this is not normal behavior. I mean, mm -hmm. Taylor Swift's great at that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting. So it sounds like uh, finding the people that can re uh, question you when you say you're fine. Safely, and that uh, you feel safe inviting into that space. Right. And also know how to have an invitation around it. Right, right. Right. Like, right. I've known Lorelai for seven, eight years now. So right. now she has the invitation. But it, over the course of time, it was, hey, can I give you a gentle reflection? Mm, yeah. Right. The invitation is so important. Yeah. The So the... Uh, well, also, yeah, extending the invitation of like, hey, I need someone to kind of help me uh -huh. be aware when I'm not being aware. And then, however, yes. additionally building that muscle, whether that's just through journaling or maybe even just moments of silence of mm -hmm. when I say I'm fine, what am I actually feeling? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, what's real? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I think it's a great segue. I want to I wanna hop a little bit more into your book, into the new book. Yeah. And... Uh, just trying to decide where I want to even start here. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's, that's been the common thing. Everybody's like, well, I read it in one sitting, and how do you describe this book? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, and it's, it's, it's so refreshing to get such a honest expression of a human journey. Mm, thank you. And yeah, maybe even just to start, could you give like a, a synopsis of the book and kind of the personal mm. challenges and triumphs you cover in it, just so people have like a basic... Yeah. Knowledge. Yeah. So the book starts with a loving disclaimer of the first several chapters are heavy and they're hard. It opens up with me giving the eulogy at my late fiance's funeral. And even that is nuanced. We had a wedding certificate, but it hadn't been a form officially signed by a person we would have paid to sign the certificate. So that's mm. even interesting there. And he died a week before the wedding. So our fun the funeral basically was what would have been our wedding. Right. And then I go, I flash back into what happened the night he died. And I, I that that's the opens up a deeper exploration of the human journey through the darkness and the light, utilizing my entire story, even the elements we've already been talking about, as a case study and very real snippets of what I went through, conversations, dialogues, the very sensory moments mm -hmm. of my world to then pull back into illuminating the science of what's happening in those moments, whether it be having a moment of a trauma reaction at the Gorbals here in Los Angeles at a comedy show and ending up balled up on Hollywood Boulevard, sobbing, having a panic attack, and how I handled that to the best of my ability, or you know, trying to date after such a deep attachment loss with my fiance and piled upon huge attachment wounds from my childhood and a really discombobulated attachment style. And the, all the way back to what we were talking about, suicidal considerations mm -hmm. and the family dynamics around all of that. Right. So my, my hope was to, as somebody who has really hyper compensated f for my insecurities and my need to bid for my worthiness with gathering a lot of degrees, which is the best way I can describe it, <laughs> and, and taking the privilege that I've had to be able to go to school and really invest in that education and turning it around and saying, even as an expert, yeah. we can know all the things and our brains will not care what we know. Yeah, they'll still brain. 
They'll still brain. They exactly. Still yeah, brain. they will still brain. <laughs> and how even thinking we know things actually can, and that's a big part of what led to my fiance's death, was thinking I knew what to do. And the hubris of it all. Yeah. You know. And yeah. Well, and it's interesting because you kind of discuss in your books and also as I've heard you speak on other podcasts, it's an interesting experience when also the thing that is your career kind of brings you to your knees yeah. of like, like your, your career has been this deep understanding of the mind. And so I, what a humbling experience for it to still be something that's like, oh, she'll still bring me to my knees, Miss Brain. She's, oh, yeah, good job. Yeah. I love you, little brain. Yeah. Strong work. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, a uh, question I had for you was, because I found, I didn't really realize, because you, you talked about overcompensating or like hypercompensating. Mm. And for so me, much. it was, I had always told myself I kind of entered this field uh, just because it was like, that I found it really interesting, and it was like, oh, I'm super interested in this. And it wasn't until more recently when I came off my antidepressant and started to really feel again for the first time. Mm -hmm. This was like a crazy realization for me where it was like, I actually really started diving into it because I was afraid if I didn't understand my mind, I might lose it. Like, yes. where it was like, I needed yes. control or I was going to lose it. And, and I, and it, these memories had gotten so buried where I remember mm -hmm. in health class when I started, it was in eighth grade, I started experiencing panic attacks mm -hmm. and this really deep anxiety, not knowing it was coming from my home life. Mm -hmm. And they're teaching us about mental illness and really intense ones like, like schizophrenia yeah. or really, you know, life altering OCD. And I remember just like, going to the bathroom, just panicking and being like, this is who I'm going to become and it's, and I'm never going to recover. Yeah. I, I really suppressed anything like high school. I never took any psychology classes. I was like, mm -hmm. I want to stay as far away from what understanding what my mind is capable of as possible. And then I think I kind of like 360'd once that memory got depressed or suppressed where I was like, actually, I want to learn everything so uh -huh. I can control it. Yeah. And so yeah. my question for you is, do you ever or have you ever kind of felt afraid of what, like, maybe like the darkness that your own mind is capable of taking you to? Historically. Yeah. Yeah. But, past. you know, I think there's, and this is my own personal experience, and I've heard this from a lot of my patients, there's also something that can be captivating about the darkness mm. of their... Are we allowed to cuss? Yeah, you can cuss. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of like the, the I, I share a poem that I wrote, gosh, back when I was in my early 20s when I was really struggling with suicidal considerations, of swan diving into the darkness. And like, there's something that can be compelling about that because it's kind of like the fuck itness, right? Mm. It's like, I'm so done and my mom and I joke about this a lot, and, and we've had an incredible healing journey. And she showed up and she did the work, you know, and I'm very mm -hmm. blessed. A lot of moms, a lot of families don't do that, and mm -hmm. she did. And there's, you know, she trained me to show well. And I, and I to this day, there, there's, I can show well. Mm. But, and so it's kind of like in the darkness where the demons... What do you mean by show gamble. well? And like we were talking about a little bit before we started the podcast, like doing the modeling thing. Like I know where the mm. forks go. I, mm. I know what to wear. I know how to dress. That kind of stuff. Right, right. I understand. Like, you know, I, even all the way down to thank you notes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, Just kind of taught you like the basics, how to like human, like ma make yeah, things happen. Yeah, but it's more than that. Like I was a debutante. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. Show, societally show well. I see what you mean. Like right, the, right, right, right. You know, and, and the worth is in the showing well. Mm, interesting. Um, okay. Like when she found out I was suicidal by, she found one of my journals and like her response was put me on Accutane and get me into modeling classes. Ooh, yeah. Interesting. Bless her sweet little heart. Yeah, bless her heart. I know. Bless her sweet little heart. Because also as a mom, like what do you even do? I mean, in Kansas. Scary. In Kansas. And she grew up in northern Michigan. Like there was no language around emotion. Yeah. And so I, for me, one of the things that really, I got put in, so I, I lived in my basement, basically I built a little house down in the basement growing up. 
And that was my safety space, is I could go down there and escape the pain and the chaos up above. Mm. And that was me starting to embrace the darkness and, and finding a home in that space where even in the deepest despair, I was like, there's a coziness here. Mm. And then eventually being like, wait a minute, that's not a good idea. I would actually also like to be in the light. Yeah. And mm. then realizing there's a spectrum. Yeah. I can be in the rainbow. And when the darkness shows up now, that's data. And right. it's important for me to pay attention to it. So it's no longer scary. Now it's empowering. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. So it really, it comes down to sort of like an idea of framing of one, yeah. I'm just going to accept it because there, it's going to be there regardless and I'm just going to accept it. And additionally, like, instead of, you know, tr flipping on fear, but flipping on curiosity of like, yes, this is data. Huge. I'm just yeah. going to, yep. what, what is happening? And I'm going to yeah. look at it as, this is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the Phoenix, what does right. the Phoenix do? The mythical bird flies into the flames, burns up and arises stronger and wiser than ever before. Mm -hmm. And Livy, do you know what a group of Phoenixes is? I heard you say this in another podcast and now I can't remember. I don't know. Well, you are a part of my odyssey. A group of an phoenixes odyssey. is an odyssey. Mm -hmm. And th that is those, the, those of us who are willing to dive into the darkness. Know that we will rise up and know that if we are stuck in the darkness, if we are burning up, we have each other. So thank mm -hmm. you for being a part of my odyssey. Yeah, thank you. And, and I imagine, you know, like for anybody listening to, I think it can be difficult, especially even me being younger and anyone listening being younger yeah. where it's, I really do feel the more you find yourself burning in the ashes, the more you'll be able to habitually move to, I will eventually rise from them as well. Yeah. And I, and I think it's just, you know, resilience builds as time mm -hmm. goes on. And I think that's a, a hopeful thing. Yeah. And as we sort of, as we sort of wrap up here, I'll do my, my quick rapid fire <laughs> questions. Gosh, I had so many other questions. Well, let's do a part two To or be something. continued. Hey, I will come over anytime. To, to be continued. <laughs> we'll do, we'll do our, we'll hop into my quick rapid fire questions. Yes. First one is, what's the best thing you've bought that costs less than $100? So not bought, but exchanged funds for, I would say, my, my rescue kitties and puppies. Hmm. Such a good answer. I love yeah, that. My sweet babies. And for, as somebody highlighted earlier, Yes, that may cost a little bit more these days. They are right. all quite old, so this goes all the way back to the early, right, two, right, right, early right. 2000s. Yeah. yeah. And the second one is, what piece of advice do you give others that you often have a tough time taking yourself? Dance. Mm, I like that. Dance. Dance yeah. more. Dance in the kitchen, dance in your car. Yeah. Yeah. Third question is, do you have any specific fashion or clothing essentials? Is there something oh, you really love? The show well part of me is a solid button down. I always have a solid <laughs> button down. The cozy part of me is just any kind of amazing hoodie. Mm, yes. Love my hoodies. I'm a good hoodie. Would you, yeah. if you're picking a hoodie, would you pick like, do you tend to gear more towards just like more neutral colors or do you like a little bit of a color in there? Oh, it's a, it's a fabric. I'm a highly sensitive person, so it's a fabric ah, thing. So I like really. Color doesn't even matter. No, I just want it to be comfy. sensory. Mm, yeah. Cozy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Finding like a really good, solid, like, ah, hoodie is yeah. just the Yeah. Oh, I know. I mean, I have one from 1994 that I still wear. Yeah. yeah. And then fourth question is, what is a song that you've had on repeat lately? Oh, gosh. So many. I'm a huge music person. Lord Huron. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Lord Huron. He's mm -hmm. amazing. Probably End of the Earth. He'll meet me at the end of the earth. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a story of epic journeys, the heroine her journey. I like it. I yeah. like it. And then actually, instead of my fifth question, what's a book you love? I kind of want to ask, is there a favorite chapter of yours in your book where you mm. wrote it and you go back and read it and you're like, that's my soul on paper? Oh, that's a really good, I don't even know what chapter it is, but pr there's a specific section in the book where I was in a mountain swimming um, and we just actually gone to see a psychic, which as a scientist was a very interesting dynamic and actually had a couple of people say, you need to take that out. But it was one of those moments of just the spiritual resonance and the, the psychic was like, you brought the wrong thing and actually this, and this, I, I brought a to my f late fiance's childhood toy. We were together for 10 years. Right. And I brought his, one of his childhood stuffies and she's like, you should have brought this bear. Hmm. 
And it was a bear that he had actually given to me when I was very, very, very sick. That she had no idea. She had no idea we were there. Right. So it's just one of those moments of a spiritual reckoning of, as much as we know about science, Lord knows. What, I mean, there's so much going on out there. I'm a spiritualist. Like there's so much going on out there that we yeah. don't know. Yeah. And the end of that chapter was really a reckoning with my soul, of mm. finding a way forward and recognizing in this ice cold mountain lake, swimming with his eldest sister, who was one of his dearest friends, sister's fa favorite person in the entire world, Amy, um, that we just have to keep breathing. We just have to, and, and that was a big part of where the name of the book came from. We just, this is what mm. it is. Well, I'm glad it stayed in the book. Thank you for yeah. keeping it. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, we've, my editor, yeah. Chelsea, is amazing. Thank you, Chelsea, you're amazing. Yeah. Thank uh, you, Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> we fought for that chapter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. Well, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Uh, thank um, you. And thank maybe you just work. really fast, where do people, where would you want people to find you? Or like even to resources as well, if anyone's interested yeah. in looking more into what you do. Yeah, so the books are available at all your major book resellers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, wherever you buy books. The bookshop's great because it's a nonprofit, it supports other local authors. I have a lot of book events coming up. My social media is very shareware. So if, I, I always say like the memoir, that's unique, but you can go on my social media, tons of exercises, educational resources, guided meditations. I'm also hashtag ask a psychologist is my kind of moniker online. Mm. So if you have a question about neuroscience, trauma, resilience, any of the things, go on any of my channels, leave a question and we'll do a video. I'll do you know a post, whatever it is, because it's all about turning it around. Mm. How do we help people have the information to be stronger and better within themselves? I'm super pumped to see you've reached the end of the podcast. Not only because you hung out with me and our guests, but because you took the time to better your life through the stories and advice shared on this podcast. And if y'all would go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review, that would seriously mean the world to me. And if something in the podcast really sparked an aha moment for you, please share it with those you love and get a conversation going because I truly believe that that is where the magic happens. So keep learning, seizing the moment, and intentionally creating your life. Thanks for listening and I hope to have you back soon.